the United States of Africa. Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. Psalms 68 verse 31. The only hope of solution for the Negro problems of America and Africa is for the United Nations with America and England playing the leading role to divide the African continents into separate sections so that the blacks and whites may live there within their own zones of influence and that each may live his own life and worship God beneath their own wine and fig tree. Much has been done for the oppressed nations of Europe, for France, Belgium, Poland, Greece, China, the Philippines, and India. Our men are dying upon a hundred battlefields on the far-flung fronts of the world for a democracy which is denied the black race in America and his blood brothers in their father's land, Africa. The recent race riots in Detroit and New York, lynchings in the South and current race friction through the nation in the midst of the greatest and gravest war in human history are evidence of one fact, that if the colored race is to be protected from mob violence, economic handicaps, race, riots, and all social injustices, they must create their own social order and build their own national life. The same conditions of segregation and exploration that confronts the race in America exist among the colonial powers in Africa on a much larger scale. And I am only asking the great powers of the world for a place where black men may live in their own homeland, free and unmolested by racial prejudices and economic handicaps. The race problem in America has become a political and social racket. And I say in all frankness of soul, mind, and heart, the many books on this subject do not even touch the surface of the problem. The only solution is self-determination upon the part of the Negro to build for himself and posterity a new world. If the black race of America and America is to survive after this great catastrophe, it must rise to take its place as a nation among the other nations of the earth and their rights respected by all men. You hear that some of the so-called friends of the black race and also some of its own racial leaders remark that the Negro race in America has made the greatest progress of any race in the world since its emancipation. But this is not true in any sense of constructive reasoning. Such a statement has not one leg to stand on. It's an air castle expression or like a house built upon a sand only waiting for the floods to descend and it will be washed away. Racial progress is rated by its industrial and economic assets such as trade, commerce, political influence, and power. The Negro possessed none of these essentials, but none of these are beyond his attainments. The race is handicapped by the American dual system of society, which forces each race to make its progress in separate units. This is utterly impossible to do while living in the same community and country without a conflict of interest. The competition is too great. The only solution to these conditions is land grant territory. The race was emancipated after having toiled and worked as slaves for nearly 250 years and turned loose without a dime or a foot of land. The race has never been given territory, but instead they were emancipated and left on their master's plantations. A man is never free on another man's ground. The establishment of a Negro nation on the African continent would not mean that all Negroes would be compelled to go there, but it would be open for those who desire to go and build a nation for themselves, just as the Pilgrim Fathers came to America with the blueprint of an empire and began their, this nation. Such a movement would serve as an outlet for the ambitions of the youth of the race who are now being 
educated here without a future. Such industrial colleges as Tuskegee, Tuskegee in Alabama, Hampton, Virginia, Tennessee State, Mississippi Industrial, and a hundred other schools and colleges throughout America could train the colored youth to do pioneer work in the building of this new nation. <coughs> Such program, <coughs> excuse me. Such program to begin with would revise the system of Negro education with a racial background of its own history. Today, the colored youth is educated to know more about the history and achievements of all races but their own. The colored youth need different slant on the history of his own race in Africa. Today, they are being educated as Negroes, yet there is no such race found on the pages of ancient history. The word was formerly used by the Spanish slave trader, meaning the meaning black moor, and later became the trademark of the slave traffic, but it has no anthropological setting in history. The black race of America are descendants of the Ethiopians, and absolutely they are not Ethiopian. Absolutely they are not Negroes. This African nation would be a balance of power for world peace and would serve as a great factor to hold in check the rising tides in Asia. There are over 1,600 million of non-whites in the world today, but the Negro is the only group of darker race that has taken on Western culture. The Chinese as a nation still follow the teaching of Confucius. The Hindus still bow at the shrine of Buddha. The Japanese believe in Shinto, the Arabs. Turks and Indians still look to Mecca, but the Negroes have mastered in 50 years civilization that took the white man a thousand years to build, and they have taken the white man's religion more seriously than he did. Planting a Negro nation on the west coast of Africa with the Ethiopian Christian nation on the east coast would readily bring Africa into the fold of Western culture and religion, which would eventually overthrow Mohammedan activities on that continent. This new African nation would be a great asset to the markets of America, and educated and cultural Africa would have a far greater purchasing power than a few whites who now live there. The time was never riper than now to launch this program. The race problem has reached its acute stage both in America and in Africa. The frictions and clashes between whites and blacks have become almost a daily occurrence in one section or another throughout the nation. The Negro's only solution is self-determination. That is to build a nation for themselves. While I have often heard remarks that the Negro cannot govern themselves, I have found this to be nothing but colonial propaganda and excuse for exploitation. Exploitation. Negroes have been governors, kings, queens, princes in Africa for many thousand years. The late Negro governor general in French Equatorial Africa, Felix Sylvester Ibu, a full-blooded black man, Born in Kenyan, French Guinea, he was governor of a province five times larger than France that contained an area over one million square miles, one third as large as continental United States. This black governor defied the Axis after Paris and the French Empire in northern Africa and the East collapsed, but Ibu stood as a stone wall. Jackson, in defiance of the Axis power, he swung his strategical strength to De Gaulle, and by so doing, he saved the British colonists from Axis penetration. The great service which Governor Ibu rendered France, the Allies, and his black countrymen of Africa, only served to show the wisdom of what black leaders could and would do for the race when given an opportunity. The following tribute was paid this noble governor by Jean de la Roche of the French 
Liberation Committee of New York and reviewing his life, France has lost its greatest colonial administrator. He was a great Frenchman, one of the greatest. He could discourse in theology with Catholic or Protestant. His knowledge of philosophy was phenomenal. He knew the best literature of the world carried the poetry of his country. In his colossal memory spoke English, Spanish, French, and was fluent in the language of the three African tribes. He knew every village in the 1,225,754 square miles under his administration, each chief and many of their subjects as well. Also thousands of white settlers among the six million of inhabitants. In the midst of prosecuting the war, Ibu, that's capital E-B-O-U-E, maintained light, motorized troops financed by his people, both the rich and poor. And he conducted one of the most enlightened colonial programs of modern times. He began a frontal attack on tropical diseases, increasing the number of physicians from 200 to 3,600, and sent teams of native and French doctors and corps of native nurses to clean up infected area areas. He opened schools for the instruction of the natives as medical aides and midwives and inaugurated a system of public work and sanitation, including control of purification of water supplies. Sir Harry Johnson in his book, British Central Africa, page 182 says, It all remains to say a few words about the relations between the Europeans and the natives. I am convinced that this eastern portion of Central America will never be a white man's country. Between the Sambuzi and the Blue Nile, Africa in the first instance must be governed in the interest of the black man and the blacks will be the race predominant in numbers if not in influence. The future of tropical Africa is to be another India, not another Australia. Yet Central America possesses boundless resources in the way of commerce, extremely rich in natural products, animals, vegetables, and minerals which will pay the Europeans to develop and equally profit the black man to produce. A letter from H.M. Stanley, African explorer in W. Lord Claw's book, Black America, page 211, says, There is space enough in one section of the upper Congo Basin to locate doubly the numbers of Negroes in the United States without disturbing a single tribe now inhabiting that co the country. I refer to the immense upper Congo forest country, 350,000 square miles in extent, which is three times larger than the Argentine Republic. Jan Christian Smuts in his book Toward a Better World, page 41, says, If Africa has to be redeemed, if Africa is to make her own contribution to the world, if Africa is to take a place among the continents, we shall have to proceed on different lines and in Evolve a policy which will not pour her institutions into a European mold. If they live mixed up together, it is not practical to sort them out under separate institutions of their own. Institutional segregation carries with its territory segregation. Dr. W.B. Du Bois, in his book, Dark Waters, quotes, Colored America demands that the return of the conquered German colonists should not be returned to Germany, neither held by the Allies. Thousands of colored men, sick of white arrogances and hypocrisy, see in their races only salvation. Bishop H. M. Turner of the AME Church wrote, W. P. Pickett, a letter endorsing Pickett's book, Abraham Lincoln's solution of the race problem says, I pray God that you may continue the great work you are now engaged in and move this country to help immigrate the Negro to the land of his ancestors. I have visited the country as many times as I have fingers on my hand, and it is one of the richest countries under the whole heaven and natural resources. Millions of colored people in this country want to go. 
Bishop William D. Chappelle of the African M.E. Church in his biography says, I have believed and now believe that Ethiopia will stretch forth her hands to God, that the American Negro through the religious zeal which the African Methodist Church is fostering and racial pride, which education and proper understanding ought to prepare him mentally and financially to go to his kinsmen on African soil and intermingling business and marriage develop the Negro to degrees of attainment undreamed by us. History of Mankind, Volume 2, page 257, Zell. It is assumed of a number of African races that they are hybrids. Harder one has been designated by all observers as wholly pure, and even when we consider those which have sprung up in historical times from the combination of known elements, no other portion of the earth offers so many so large and so influential hybrid races, the Moors, to the north, the Sudanese to the south of the desert, the Swadulas in the east, and the Bastards in the south. And in this, it is not merely a case of little drop of African blood, but it takes the first place. We must not call it European, Europeanization or Arpenization, but Negronization. On the east coast, this process can be observed in the descendants of Arabs on the west and those of Portuguese and Negro women. Similarly, the population of the Libyan desert of Fens and even of Morocco itself is in a fair way to become Negro. It is their numbers that the historical force of the African has hitherto lain. Masses of them have been thrown on the coast of Asia, America, and even Europe. In America, the whole island as San Domingo and Jamaica have fallen to the Negro. Several states of the Union as well as Nicaragua show Negro majorities and in Brazil all classes are permeated by the Negro elements as a rule. Indeed, they have remained patiently in lower walks of life, thereby not belying the basis of their historical character their capacity for education. However, it is in result that may at perhaps no very remote epoch materially alter our judgment as to the capacity and historical destiny of the stock. In our day, Africa has become the scene of a great movement which must fix its destiny in history for thousands of years while a century ago the great political and trading powers were still merely hanging on like leeches to its outskirts. Today, the spheres of interest, domains of power of which the extent is not yet known even to their own, are meeting in the far interior of the continent. Herewith, for the first time, Europeans are coming in close connection with the most vigorous shoot of the dark branch of nations on the soil most appropriate to it. But to them in the first place by no means favorable. Now it will be decided whether much or little of these, the oldest of all now living stocks, will press into the mankind of the remotest of future. And that is one of the greatest problems of the history of the world, which must be the history of mankind. The United States of Africa, a prophecy. In a volume called The Progress of Race, 31, edited by Professor J.H. Krogman, Booker T. Washington, and J.W. Gibson says, unless the Negro out of Africa goes to Africa seeking a home because he has none goes on his volition with a correct knowledge of Africa. In my opinion of the future, what I says, Healy, Chatelain, I should not hesitate to declare my conviction that within a hundred years all the Bantu land will contain more than 500 million inhabitants, will equal Europe in civilization, will be united in a great United States of Central Africa under a new and improved condition of our American Constitution. 
will both speak and write a common language. The mother tongue of the Bantu dialects as revised by scholars and enriched by the best development of its daughters will produce masterpieces of literature, science, and art vying with all the best that Europe and America will then be able to bring forth. Therefore, I am asking in the name of the Almighty God for the United States to include within their peace covenant a territorial grant of 4 million square miles of territory to be set apart on the west coast of Africa with a full outlet to the sea, including the former German colonies in East and West Africa, be set apart as an exclusive domain for the Ethiopian race and to be known as the United States of Africa. The international state would solve the race problem in America and would in the meantime emancipate the natives from 400 years of slavery, serfdom, and exploitation by colonial powers which has been a curse to the continent. It would be the fulfillment of the prophecy that Ethiopia would stretch out her hands unto God and that Liberia would become another Plymouth Rock where pilgrims yet may land, where the color of man's skin will not be a bar to his ambition.